Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. Yo, it's your boy, the odd guy himself, Malik King Scott. Hi, I'm Charlie Edwards. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 32 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined this week by, once again, a lady that joined us a couple weeks back now, Mrs. Mimi Melendez. Mimi, welcome to the show once again. Thanks for coming on. Hi, thanks for having me again. Hey, it's my pleasure. I, as once again, couldn't be with us. Right, let's dive straight into the reviewing from last week. We're going to start last Thursday, the 19th of April. One fight that happened over in Montreal in Quebec, Canada. Um, yeah, one fight to mention over here. Oscar Rivas, he's the guy who, I believe, fought in the Olympics a while back. I think he's the Colombian fighter. He's, he's based, I think, though, in Canada. It's quite a funny situation. Anyway, his record now, 23-0. and He made his opponent retire on his store after just two rounds. It was scheduled for eight. His opponent, Sergio Ramirez, 16-5 and going in, now 16-6. and So another win there for Oscar Rivas. I'd like to see him stepped up quite a bit in class. Class really seems to be fighting guys that we haven't heard of, and he's actually quite a good talent. So I'd like to see some more from him. Uh, moving over now to uh, to France, actually. I think this card happened on the Friday, if I'm not mistaken. Um, just one fight to mention, really. A guy over here called Christopher Le- I think it's Christopher Legendra. I could be pronouncing that wrong. Probably am. Um, his record, 11-8. and eight. He took on a guy that's quite hot in the news, I suppose, over in the UK now, called Cedric Paynow. That's the guy that um, had that life and death fight with Conor Ben, in, you know, in, in, in which many people thought that he perhaps deserved to win the decision. Well, anyway, unfortunately for, for, for Cedric Paynow fans, he was actually knocked out in round six of a scheduled eight-rounder. So he has now gone into losing, um, you know, losing, in, to a losing record, if you like, he's now five and six with three draws. Um, to be honest, I think he does deserve a rematch against Conor Ben because that was a bit of a crazy, uh, crazy verdict. I remember that night, but um, yeah, like I said, doesn't really look good to you know to lose by knockout to a guy that was 11 and 8. But that's it for France there. Moving over to Germany now, heavyweight clash over here. Tom Schwartz, his record 20 and 0, he fought for the Germany BDB heavyweight title. I haven't heard of that. And also the WBO Intercontinental heavyweight title against a guy called Senad Gashi, who I hadn't actually heard of, but he was 16 and 0 with 16 knockouts going into the fight. Um, the fight ended prematurely once again. It didn't go the full 12, but this time it was a disqualification for Mr. Gashi, the man that went in there with 16 knockouts. He got disqualified. I'm not quite sure as to why, but anyway, the man in the other corner, Tom Schwartz, moves successfully to 21-0. and 0. Also on this bill on the undercard here, Ajit Kabayel, the guy that beat Derek Chisora a few months ago, he defended successfully his EBU European heavyweight title, and he's also now 18-0. and 0. It was a TKO in round three against Miljan Rovkanin, who's now 19-2. and 2. So quite a, you know, a fairly decent defense there of the EBU European title. Moving over now to Poland. Again, a couple of fights over here. Prospect on the bill called Adam Bowski. He moved to 12-0. and 0. He also picked up the vacant... Uh, it's now not vacant, of course. He's the champion. But it was the Republic of Poland International Cruiserweight title. The man in the other corner, Denis Grachev, he lost, unfortunately, over 10 rounds unanimously. His record now 16-7 and seven with one draw. The return of the Polish um, the Polish hero, I suppose, Tomasz Adamek, 52-5. and five. He stepped in the ring. It was for the Republic of Poland International Heavyweight title. He took on Joey Abel. That's the guy who, like I said, he, he's a big puncher, but I don't think he takes a punch so well. So a lot of his fights tend to end pretty early. Well, anyway, this one ended early once again. A TKO in the seventh round for Tomasz Adamek. The Polish home fighter did the business there. Um, very unlucky. Lucky there for Joey Abel. That's his tenth loss now. His record thirty-four and ten. And Thomas Adamek fifty-three and five. When's he going to hang those gloves up? I don't think he's he's thinking about that at all. Um, and the main event over here, 
Matthias Masternik, a really tough fight here for the WBO European Cruiserweight title. Uh, the belt was vacant beforehand, but yeah, Masternik 40 and 4 took on Yuri Kalenga. Um, 23 and 4. Kalenga, like I say, a really tough guy. Um, you know, when he turns up, he can seriously make make anyone, uh, you know, have a hard night's work. Well, anyway, it was a hard night's work for him because he actually retired on his store after six rounds. So quite a good win there for Mastinek. Win number 41 out of his 45 pro fights. Moving over now to Sweden. Um, just one fight to mention on this bill, actually. Two heavyweights. Otto Wallin, 19-0, and 0, took on Adrian Granat, 15-1. and 1. Um, Both are, you know, huge Swedish um, heavyweight prospects, so quite a quite a big fight there for Sweden. Although it, of course, went under the radar to some of the you know the more kind of famous boxing nations. But anyway, it was for the EBU European Union heavyweight title. So that's like it's not the EBU, it's not the proper kind of one. It's the European Union one. So it's, it's kind of like the interim title, I suppose, or like a regular belt of the of the original full European title. But to not confuse anybody, Otto Wallin got the victory. He was the favourite, of course, as well. He moved to 20-0 now. It was a unanimous decision over 12 rounds. Two judges, um, well, one judge having it 117-111. Uh, the other judge 117-112. And the other judge 118-110. So quite wide there for Otto Wallin. That's it there from the... Whew, this is the Gardahov Ice Hockey Arena in Sundsvall, Sweden. So... Uh, I'm quite happy with the way I pronounce that, to be honest. Now, though, the Echo Arena, Liverpool, Merseyside, United Kingdom. This was one of the two major fight cards in the UK last weekend. We're going to start with the undercard. Kez Ashfak moved to 2-0. and It was a points win over four rounds against Ricky Starkey. Uh, Tom Farrell, he moved to 15-1. and one. It was a TKO in round three against Mwenya Chisanga, who was only 1-3 and three with one draw going in a late um, a late change of opponent, I believe, there. Sam Eggington stepped in the ring. His first fight at 154. He knocked out his opponent, Achilles Cesarbo, in the second round. Uh, so a good start there at light middleweight there for Sam Eggington. His record now 22-4. and four. Connor Ben moved to 12-0. and 0. It was a TKO in round four against Chris Truman. 13-8 and eight with two draws. Um... Also on this bill, Scott Fitzgerald moved to 10-0. and That's double figures for him. It was a points win over eight rounds against Laszlo Fazekas. Um, Anthony Fowler moved to 6-0. and It was a TKO in round two against Ryan Toms. Um, Natasha Jonas also on this bill. She fought for the WBA International Female Super Featherweight title. She moved to 6-0. and It was a TKO in round seven against Teusi El Hadji. 5-7 and seven now with one draw. Um, before we talk about some of the some of the you know the, the bigger fights on this bill, just to kind of dissect some of the others um, that happened here, what I will say about Sam Eggington's fight, he seemed to really make easy work of his Hungarian opponent. I quite liked the look of Sam Eggington. It was over before you know it with him. Connor Ben, it was a good win for him. I felt that. Um, when when his fight started kind of hotting up, when the fight was turning into a bit of a fight rather than a boxing match, that was at the same point where his opponent sort of didn't want to know. I mean, he got he got knocked down. He wasn't too motivated to get back up, I didn't feel. I feel like he was happy that the fight ended. Um, as for Anthony Fowler's fight, I mean, you know, it was a right uppercut to the body that finished his opponent, Ryan Toms. It was very honest as well from um, from Anthony Fowler in the post-fight interview in which he said he didn't really learn too much from that win. And he felt that Ryan Toms could have probably got back up. But yeah, good performance, um, just as expected really from, from Anthony Fowler. Just as, again, the fight was heating up, he pulled out a fight finishing shot. So credit to him, and also it was in front of his home crowd. It was it was also his first scheduled eight-rounder. But, you know, in this case, like I say, he only went two, uh, two rounds. He didn't need the eight. And interestingly, Sam Eggington was actually supposed to be fighting Ryan Toms. But instead of, um, of, of that... Fowler actually stole his opponent, and Sam Eggington, you know, he had to have the late replacement Hungarian guy that I just spoke about. As for Natasha Jonas, I mean, I only saw the stoppage. I turned the channel over right as the punch landed for her. Um, her and her opponent, they both threw a hook at the same time. You know, a big, a big, I think it was a big right hook, and Natasha seemed to buzz her opponent, and then she kind of bundled her to the ground, really. The girl got up, but the referee, um, the referee waved it off. I mean, to be honest, in my, in my honest opinion, I don't think that the girl was 
was all that hurt to actually stop the fight, but um, you know she'd never been stopped before, so I suppose it's a bit of a statement there for Miss GB as she goes as she goes now with that little alias. But um, moving up the bill once again, trying to go through this pretty quickly. Sean Masher Dodd he moved to fifteen and three with one draw. It was an unsuccessful defense of his Commonwealth lightweight title against Tommy Coyle, twenty three and four going in now twenty four and four. It was a TKO in round six for Tommy Coyle. Dodd was actually down twice in that fight in total. Um, firstly. Before I come over to you, Mimi, if you did see any of this card. Did you manage to see any of this card, or did you see Khan's fight at all just before I carry on? No, I, I wasn't able to see that. That wasn't televised um, yeah, I didn't, in the US. I didn't, I didn't think so. I didn't think so. But this fight here, um, you know, Tommy Coyle came out straight away. He was working the jab right away in the early rounds. Masha Dodd, as per usual, you know, he starts quite slow. He gave up those early rounds. And I think that Dodd felt Coyle's power in the third round, and he was rocked. And it seemed like... Um, from that point onwards, it was really all Coyle. I mean, it, it was all Coyle the whole fight, really. But Coyle dropped Dodd in the fourth round. Um, it started with with a brilliant straight right counter from Coyle. And Dodd dipped right down. It almost looked like he touched down. And when he popped back up, Coyle completely swarmed him and dropped him with a left uppercut. I think the final punch was in that round there. And Dodd did come out in round five. And he did respond quite well. But even still, I think that Coyle's counter punching was on point, And he captured that round also on my card. Then... Speaking of counter-punching, a beautiful straight right counter, just like the the earlier shot that dropped, well, it didn't drop Dodd, the earlier shot, but it it troubled Dodd. Um, It it dropped him here. He was dropped with a straight right counter in the sixth round, and when Masha Dodd was down, he seemed to bang his gloves together. You know, initially, the commentators were saying it was probably out of frustration, but I thought that he may have been, you know, applauding the shot by Coyle. Who knows? But yeah, Masha got back up bravely, and he tried to continue, but once again, Again, Tommy Coyle jumped on him and forced a stoppage from the referee. And also, the White Tower made an appearance as well, you know, by by Sean Masha Dodd's corner. So, a bit of a shame there for Masha Dodd, because we all have grown to like him, really. He, you know, he turns up every time and really gives it a right go, but it just wasn't to be his night there. Um, you know, I don't really know what he does from here. I think that he's... He's, you know, he's got quite a few decisions to make. Really, his record now, like I say, fifteen and three with one draw. Tommy Coyle, twenty-four and four. Um, we did do predictions on last week's show as well. I actually went with Coyle to win that fight by knockout, and the listeners went with Dodd on points, and I as went with Coyle on points. So I was very happy when I got that one right. But the main event here, Amir Khan, thirty-one and four, took on Phil Lagreco, twenty-eight and three. Boy, oh boy. Um, This fight here, I mean, it was over, like I say, before you knew it. I think the whole fight lasted about 41 seconds, including the count. Um, I mean, we saw blistering speed from Amir Khan, which is... You know, which is expected really. The two knockdowns in total came, like I say, in 41 seconds of the first round the fight was over. Um, you know, it was the first fight for Khan in the UK for five years. It was the first fight since being brutally knocked out by Canelo two years ago. Is the ring rust gone? That's that's really the million dollar question, I suppose. It's hard to say because, you know, it seemed to be over so quick. Like I say, 41 seconds. We didn't really find out too much. I think the next fight will tell us a lot more for Amir Khan. It was a good little moment in the ring afterwards with Kel Brook as well. I don't know if you managed to see a clip of that. Um, You know, Kel Brook got in the ring and Khan was saying this and Kel Brook was saying that. One thing to point out, though, I like to throw a fact in here and there. Khan does outdo Errol Spence's win over Phil LaGreco. Errol Spence needed three rounds. Khan only needed 40 seconds. Um, you know, if you can draw something to that, then you can. But I'm just here to point the facts out. Surprisingly, the way Khan did it, though, um, you know, he hadn't scored a knockout for over five years. And let's face it, that was against Carlos Molina. And that's not the good Carlos Molina. That's like, I don't want to call him a fake Carlos Molina. But it's not It's not the best Carlos Molina. There's two or three or even four or five Carlos Molinas. It wasn't a good one. Um, so yeah, first round knockout did shock me, to be honest. I mean, the listeners weren't too shocked. I mean, they did go with a knockout win and they got, you know, they got a point for that. But I don't think anyone expected it as early as 41 seconds. I went with Khan on points and so did Ayaz. So we both came up short there. Um, 
Moving over now, though, to the SSE Arena in Belfast, Northern Ireland, United Kingdom. Did they show any of this in in the States, the Carl Frampton? um... Yes, I was able to watch um, the fight between um, Donair and Carl Frampton. The problem was that um, it, it was on YouTube, so I was able to stream it on YouTube. Ah, okay. Well, I'll go to you first. What did you make of that fight there before I before I rumble on? Oh, you can start. Go ahead. I'll just follow up on you. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm going to start with the undercard, of course. Um, it was annoying because, like I say, this 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 card actually clashed with the matchroom card. So it was kind of like you're flicking between two channels. You don't really want to record one whole entire show and then watch it back because you're hours and hours behind social media, which is always a problem. But, um, I mean, if we start with the Comrade Cummins versus Luke Keeler fight, this was very interesting. Um, it was a weird choice from 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 uh, the referee, Phil Edwards. I'll get to that. He, he made quite a strange choice during the fight. But the record's going in. Uh, Comrade Cummins 13 and 1 with one draw, Luke Keeler 13 and 2 with one draw. So similar similar resumes on paper. Um, it was for the vacant WBO European middleweight title. Comrade Cummins came up short though. Luke Keeler got the victory. It was a 10 round unanimous decision. Like I say, there was a strange decision from from referee Phil Edwards. He decided to let the fight continue despite it looked like the doctor was quite angry that the referee wasn't stopping the fight because it looked like the doctor wasn't happy with the cut. And the doctor seemed to be kind of annoyed with the referee. They were kind of bickering. And in this particular fight, the doctor wasn't able to stop the fight. It was all up to the referee. And for whatever strange reason, he wanted um, to, you know, for the fight to carry on. Now... Um, the, the, the cut calls, actually, I remember now it was a head clash. It was There was just many, many, many head clashes going in all night. And thankfully, the head clash was acknowledged by the referee, the one that did open the cut. Because, you know, obviously, if it was caused by a punch and the referee... Or it was caused by a head and the referee didn't, didn't see it and he thought it may have been a punch, then that completely changes um, what could happen if, if the fight was to be called off. But, yeah... Um, Luke Keeler, it's the first time I've had a good look at him. I think he, he fights a lot like a small version of Joe Calzaghe. The way he keeps his hands down and really, you know, throws out the spiteful jab almost from the hips. He, he really impressed me with, with his work. I feel that, and I don't want to be too harsh now, but I feel that Comrade Cummins is a tad overrated. I mean, we all know he's kind of like a really good friend of Carl Frampton, but I don't think he's much else, and I don't want to be too critical there. He just didn't impress me whatsoever. A good fight that I think you know could happen domestically for Comrade Cummins would be perhaps Marcus Morrison or maybe even uh, Felix Cash. I think you'd probably have to favour Felix Cash, but... Yeah, I mean, this Luke Keeler, like I said, the first proper time I've watched him, and I think he can really go on to big things. I'd have to look at his resume. I know that, of course, he's you know, he's, he's not unbeaten. Obviously, he's lost two fights, and I don't think they were at a particular good level. So I don't know what happened there, but I know he's now taking boxing serious, which is what we hear from a lot of fighters. I know that he's now apparently a full-time boxer. I think he previously was a part-time boxer, so... All the very best to Luke Keeler. Like I say, he's the new WBO European middleweight champion. Um, also on this bill, Tyrone McKenna, 15-0 and 0 with one draw, took on Anthony Upton, 17-1. and 1. Upton did beat McKenna back in the amateurs, so this was kind of like... Uh, you know, Tyrone McKenna's revenge, if you like. Now, Upton, his style, he reminds me a lot of Andy Lee in the fact that they're both insanely tall for their weights. They both have got really skinny-looking legs, and they're both southpaws. I'm not sure that Upton has got that Andy Lee-type power, but he is only a light welterweight. You know, he's only 140. I expected more of a fun fight, really, from both the guys here. I did find myself switching over to watch Natasha Jonas a little bit and and her post-fight interview. Um, It seemed to be a close fight, though. I mean, Upton is definitely the cuter of the two, but I felt that McKenna had the higher work rate despite not really using his size to his advantage. McKenna did score a knockdown. I think it was in round nine, if I'm not mistaken. It was a delayed reaction from, I believe, a left hook in which Upton took a knee temporarily. I felt that the knockdown probably would have made all the difference on the cards, but it didn't in the end. Um, it was quite a wide win for Tyrone McKenna. I can't remember the scorecards now, but a 10-round points win for him. Um, I say scorecards, I think it was actually just the referee scoring it. So, yeah, quite a um, 
it's, it's, it's a weird thing. I don't think they do it over in the States, actually, but sometimes over in the UK, a referee can be actually refereeing and judging a fight at the same time, which is kind of mad. But anyway, Tyron McKenna now remains undefeated. He's now 16-0, and and he avenges that defeat to Anthony Upton, which goes back to the amateurs a long, long time ago. I think it was about 10 years ago or so. Anthony Upton now 17-2. and um, Also, the, the final fight to mention before we get on to the main event, Zolani Tete. A lot of people very reluctant to talk about this. He defended successfully his WBO World Bantamweight title. He moved to 27-3. and It was a unanimous decision over 12 rounds against Omar Navarez, who is now 48-3 and with two draws. Um... Because of, I think it was the Amir Khan fight and all the rest of that, I, f- I think that was the case, I actually switched the Tete fight on from round six onwards, and everybody assures me that that was the right thing to do. Everyone said, um, you know, don't go back and watch the first six rounds, you didn't miss a thing. So I was happy to watch it from round six onwards, but it was a very, very boring fight. Um, it was, you know, it was supposed to be a really good win, because... Zolani Tete was actually put on this show to make a bit of a statement in Ryan Burnett's backyard. The problem was, um, Navarez, who's been around forever, he's been around for absolutely ever, he's, you know, I think he's been boxing for coming up something mad, like about 20 years. He was very, very, very negative, and the styles just simply didn't gel, so it was a real hard fight to get through, to be honest. Um, the less said, the better on that one. What I will say, it was a very dominant performance from Zolani Tete, despite really getting out of first gear, he did completely dominate this guy, who, like I said, more than been around the block, a very experienced, crafty old guy, and um, when I say old guy I really mean that in in both ways in boxing terms and also age terms I think he's about 41 so it doesn't look great but he did ultimately shut him out I think on on most of the cards if not all of them Um, the main event though for the interim WBO world featherweight title in one corner Carl Frampton 24 and 1 in the other corner the former four weight world champion Mr. Nonito Donaire a man that's been on this show a couple of times 38 and 4 it ended up being a unanimous decision over 12 rounds for Carl Frampton I'm going to go to you first Mimi what did you make of this fight here Um, I thought the fight was great Um, there was a lot of action in it Frampton used his jab effectively, and he was fighting from a distance, setting up traps for Donaire. Um, he countered effectively. He's just a crafty, you know, high ring IQ fighter. He just has better ring generalship than, you know, Donaire does. But that's not taken away from Donaire. He's done a lot. Like you said, he's a four weight, you know, you know, champ, a four division champ, which, you know, is very, it's, it's, it's a big accolade, something to celebrate in, in boxing. Um, but I just thought that, you know, there was an obvious, you know, you know, discrepancy in levels here. You know what I mean? Carl Frampton is a very smart fighter and he's actually now because he won the WBO interim title. He is now um, Valdez's mandatory. Yeah, um, very interesting fact to that, actually. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, that's a juicy, juicy fight. But yeah, if I just fly through this, um, you know, round by round, if I can, I think that the first round was a very close round. I felt that Denaire could have probably even edged it. I think Frampton definitely took the second. I think he also managed to damage Denaire's left eye in that second round. Frampton seemed to find his rhythm very early. From about the third round, I think he really, he really, you know, got down to his work. I think he had a great third round. He looked really, really sharp and snappy with his shots. I think the fourth round was more of the same from Frampton. Frampton, he proved once again, when he's in good form, he really does look a real special fighter. I think rounds five and six were also Frampton rounds, but in round seven, that was a round where Denaire was actually pinned on the ropes and shipping a lot of punishment, and then he came back with with his own um, little flurry. It was a big uppercut that he landed, and he seemed to trouble Frampton momentarily. Frampton fired right back very bravely of him, and probably a bit stupid, to be honest, but at that time, he, he fired right back to almost kind of shrug off any kind of suggestion that he you know that he took the shot quite badly 
but you know it was a worrying second I felt for Frampton. I think Nonito Denier landed you know a, a great nice variety of shots once again in the eleventh, and he did seem to to have um, to have Frampton in some trouble in that round as well. But aside from that, he had his moments in the fight, but it just wasn't to be. Also, Carl Frampton did say that he was hurt in that eleventh round as well, which was honest of him. But aside from like I say, a few good moments from Donaire here and there, Carl pretty much dominated everything. Um, despite the age factor and, you know, we all know that Donaire's best days are behind him, it was still a special performance from Frampton. And once again, for me, he solidifies his status as arguably Britain's best pound-for-pound fighter right now. Some would argue, some would say, Anthony Joshua, Anthony Joshua, what are you talking about? But seriously, Frampton, when he switched on, can just look brilliant. You know, like you said, Mimi, his ring IQ is almost on a different level to Donaire's. Donaire was a fantastic fighter in his heyday, but this, you know, this this point in his career, he can't match Frampton, and, you know, it, it seemed like he was very much out of his depth there. Um, I'm happy that, there was no stoppage. I did say last week quite confidently that I didn't think there would be any, you know, any stoppage. I thought that this certainly was a 12 round fight and, you know, I'm happy that he didn't disgrace himself down there. And he did a lot of great things in the build up to the fight. I don't know if you saw some videos where they did like an, an an open kind of public workout a couple days before the fight. He was inviting kids up into the ring and, you know, trying to teach them how to box for about five minutes each. And it was just a great gesture from him. He's done so many great things since he was, you know in Belfast and the rest of it. So, massive credit to Donaire. He seriously is one of the best fighters, um, you know, of recent years and certainly one of the nicest guys as well. And, you know, it's all it's all the same guy. He's a nice guy and also he's, he's an even better boxer. So, yeah, real credit to the sport, Donaire. I've fought that for a long, long time. Um, going back to the predictions once again here, I went with Frampton on points. So did Ayers and so did the listeners. So we all got that one right. Um, that's it for the Belfast card, though. Moving over to the last card to mention of last week. It happened at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York, USA. Just to fly through the undercard, the brother of Gary Russell Jr., Gary Antoine Russell, he moved to 5-0. and It was a TKO in round two against Andrew Rogers, who's 4-3 and with one draw now. The brother of Marcos Maidana, Fabian Maidana, he moved to 15-0. and It was a TKO in round three against Justin Savvy, who... Uh, it was 31 and 15 with two draws going in. But coming to the three main fights, if you like, it's hard to kind of say which one was the main event, really, because they were three good fights. But let's start with... Um, I'll let you choose, Mimi. Where should we start out the three big fights on this card? Should we go Javante Davis, Jamal Charlo, or Adrian Broner? I think we should just go in the order that they were done. Put, uh, let's I can't do Davis remember first. the order they were done. <laughs> oh, Davis. <laughs> Davis. Davis was first, yeah. Okay, he moved, of course, to 20-0. and 0. It was a TKO in round three against Jesus Cuellar. It was for the WBA Super World Super Featherweight title. Um, I'm still kind of yet to clarify if he now is the youngest ever two-time world champion. I know that that's what Leonard Ellaby has been saying a lot, but if it... If it is to be true, then it really is quite an achievement from Javante Davis. It was non-stop pressure from Davis from the first bell. Quajar, you know, Quajar did put up a fight to his credit. He took a lot of shots from Davis and soaked them up. But Davis dropped Quajar in round two with a left to the body. And Quajar was able to survive the rest of that round. Davis, it just seemed, was able to walk through Quajar. You know, the punches that Quajar would throw... They just weren't getting the respect at all from Javante Davis. And in the third round, like I say, Davis dropped him again with a body shot. And the referee, I will point this out, the referee, Benji Estevez, actually said in Spanish to Cuellar, un poquito más, which of course translates to a little bit more. And I think he was subtly trying to tell Cuellar that there was only about 30 seconds left in the left in the round. But unfortunately for Cuellar, as soon as he got back up, Davis came over and threw the kitchen sink at him, which put Cuellar on the canvas for the third time in the fight. And the referee came over and waved it off. Javante Davis, you know, for the criticism that I've seen him take 
on not just his boxing and you know his dedication to the sport but the criticism I've seen him take about his speech and his speaking some people say he can't string a sentence together and stuff like that he did speak very very well after the fight I don't know if you've seen that before Mimi people say that he seems like he's not confident when he's speaking it was the best I've ever seen him speak after the fight I don't know if you picked up on that uh, maybe yes maybe no we can get to that but firstly what did you make of his performance first off I wanted to start with Cuellar um, he's a very tough guy he's aggressive very tough you know, and he is, he's, you know, he's talented and he has power, you know, and, but I will say that Tank looks spectacular in this fight. Um, once Cuellar had a taste of Davis's power, it made him less aggressive, more reluctant to let his hands go. Um, he just, and the body shots that he landed on Cuellar, he broke him down. Um, he was very intelligent with his choice, with his punches, um, his choice of punches. He, you know, it just, the way he created openings, you know, for the left uppercut and the right hook to the body with, you know, with the other punches that he was doing. Uh, Davis showed maturity and patience when he knocked down Cuellar. He didn't jump on him. He was very patient. He knew it was coming. Um, I just think that um, the, the change from his trainer to Kevin Cunningham was a very smart choice. He's a no-nonsense trainer. I think him getting out of Baltimore was a great idea. Um, he just... Cunningham has discipline and structure and a lot of focus in his, in, you know, in, in, on his camps and his training camps. So I think it was a great choice for Tank. And now we know what an into top shape Tank can actually do, which is super impressive. He looks great. Yeah, that was uh, that was quite hard to say. Let me try and say that in tip top shape Tank. Yeah, well done, Mimi. Um, yeah, you know, he 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 showed up. He's you know, I'm liking the look of Javante. I've always thought he's a he's a brilliant fighter. It seemed a bit weird last time out. Like I say, I think it was on the Mayweather McGregor undercard where his mind just didn't you know didn't seem to be on the task in front of him. But he turned up and he looked like his old self here and did a real job on his opponent. And it's also great that he hasn't had to move up in weight. A lot of people thought that because he missed the weight on that fight back in August, he would probably have to go up in weight. But he stayed at super featherweight, so I'm pleased about that. And he seemed to look really good, like I say, in great shape. He seemed to do the weight well. Um... But yeah, that's it for that fight. Like I say, Cuellar down once in round two and twice in that third and final round for him. Um, Jamal Charlo now, 26-0. and 0, He KO'd Hugo Centeno Jr. Um, in the second round. His record, by the way, now Centeno, 26-2. and 2. It was, of course, for the interim WBC world middleweight title. If I'm not mistaken, I think it was also um, unofficially or officially, however you want to put it, it was for the mandatory position to take on Triple G at some point in the near future. Another really dominant performance from Jamal Charlo. Do you know what, Mimi? I actually, I saw the knockout, but I can't remember the fight because I saw so many fights here, there, and everywhere that it's actually slipped my mind. So you're going to have to do more of the talking on this one if you don't mind, if you can save the day like you have done. Well, I'll try. Um, <laughs> I just thought that Charlo looked excellent in the ring. Um, he was sharp. He was powerful. He was smart. He just has a superior, you know, talent and the athleticism that comes with it. You know, he just he just is is a force to be reckoned with at this point. Um, I've never I, I have to admit, I've never watched um, Centeno fight before, but um, there's no shame in losing to Jamal. He is amazing and I see great things for him. I would love to see him, you know, fighting with, you know, with Triple G, Canelo, uh, BJS, Jacobs. I would love to see him step up his comp because I know that either he could beat them or he will give them one heck of a fight. He is just, I just feel like he is that talented at this point. Um, him fighting, you know, these prospects, he's just like running over them with no issues. Um, but like I said, um, Centeno's hair looked, you know, fabulous at the end of even getting knocked out, not one hair out of place. So I gotta, you know, <laughs> give him props for that. <laughs> Other than that, you know, everything, everything was just in Charlo's favor since the beginning of the first spell. Yeah, talking of good hair, um, I'm not quite sure which one of the Charlos sports a fantastic little bit of blonde in, in his afro, in his afro-style hair. If he's, I don't even know if it's called afro-style hair, but yeah, he's got a nice bit of blonde in there. So 
battle of the hair there. Um, the main event now on this one, Adrian Broner, 33 and 3, took on Jesse Vargas, 28 and 2. Remember, um, a few weeks ago, we believed in the other corner it would be Omar Figueroa. Of course, that fell through. Jesse Vargas stepped in. Initially, I wasn't too happy with that as a replacement. I still felt that Adrian Broner would win the fight, so much to the point where on the Prediction League, I went with um, with Broner to win on points, and I believe at the end of the fight, he probably did enough to get it, in my honest opinion. Um, I, as and the listeners, both went with Vargas on points, and like I say, at the end of the fight, just before they read out the verdict, I was thinking, yes, I've gained another point, and once again, my, my, uh, my unluckiness, I suppose, carries me round, or not carries me round, chases me round, and... Um, Ended up being a majority draw. One judge giving the the verdict to Adrian Broner, but overall by two judges giving it a draw. Um, this fight here, though, I mean, boy, oh boy, oh boy. Like I say, you just never know which Broner is going to turn up. You don't know if it's going to be a motivated Broner or not, and you never really know until the first bell, or even sometimes until about halfway through the fight. But Broner did seem to start quite slow, and I'm not sure if it was necessarily him starting slow or Vargas starting fast, perhaps a bit of both. I think that Vargas seemed to slow down visibly in the mid-rounds, and Broner at that point was showing us you know, his reputable skill set. He is good when he's switched on. Like I say, I think it took him a few rounds. Um, Vargas taking his foot off the pedal probably had a bit to do with that. I think that Vargas, um, I suppose he had to be, you know, he had to be rugged. He had to try and turn it into a bit of a dogfight. I don't think he could have outboxed Broner at his own game, sitting, you know, keeping the distance. I think he had to kind of get in there and rough Broner up. I think Broner was happy to take Vargas's shots on his gloves and fire back quite a lot. I did have to say, I did like... Um, Kevin Cunningham in the corner, really screaming at Broner, talking some motivation into Broner. Broner did also seem to actually listen to his corner man and, you know, not talk any any nonsense back to him or act like he knew it all, which is the kind of antics we've seen from him in the past with, with his old trainer. But I feel that... Um, you know, Vargas did get through with some with some good left hooks during the fight. He seemed to have quite a few bits of success with his left hook, especially long looping ones. But, you know, Broner didn't really seem to be phased by that power. Um, they were talking to each other in the fight a lot. That was happening pretty much all throughout the fight and even after, of course. There was a lot of talking in there. I was surprised the referee didn't say anything about that, but... Um, I feel that the referee did actually do a good job of handling the action itself. I think he 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 didn't have to do too much. He was quite happy to sit um, quite far back. I actually felt at times he should probably be a bit closer to the action. He actually sat back and enjoyed the fight, which we don't see a lot of referees do these days. Um, you know, Broner seemed to be at one point almost about one punch away from stopping Vargas. I think that was about the ninth round. He really turned the, the heat up on Vargas. Um, it was a good round for Vargas, I think, that ninth. If I remember correctly, it was a good round for him until he got caught with a shot. And then, you know, like I say, Broner really upped the pace and picked Vargas apart a little bit. But at that point, it was the clearest round to score because of the second half of that round where Broner really picked up the pace. Vargas really marked up on both eyes as well. I noticed that quite late on. And in round 10, once again, Broner really did put it on Vargas. And in the second half of the round as well, it seemed like he was kind of starting the round slow and then really coming on in the second half. It seemed like he was doing that a lot late on. Um... I almost want to say that Broner perhaps tried to save some of his energy until the later rounds to put it on Vargas. Remember, we have to bear in mind, Vargas was also coming down in weight. Only only three pounds. I think it was 144 or 143, so only three or four pounds. But still, it does make a great difference. Um... Vargas was also cut quite badly in round 11. I felt that he probably won that round, though, because Broner didn't really land too much clean, apart from the shot that, of course, opened the cut up on on Vargas. But a lot of people had it really close going into the 12th round. Um, there were scorecards going either way on, on social media. And in the 12th round, I didn't really feel that much happened. I felt that it was quite a close round, the 12th. Um, but yeah, like I say, many scorecards all over the board. I felt that Broner probably nicked it by about two rounds in in my gut. In my gut, but um, I didn't score the fight, unfortunately. Did you happen to score it at all, Mimi? Or if not, who did you have winning it in your gut? 
Um, for me personally, I thought that uh, Broner edged that one out. I had him up by two rounds as well. Yeah. Um, Vargas did extremely well in the first half of the fight. Um, he came out really strong, um, establishing that jab. You know, pot shotting to Broner's body. He, you know, and Broner because of all the jabbing, he had a hard time finding his range, and he really couldn't get his offense going because you know he was always getting the jab in his face. Um, in the second round, you know, Vargas started landing combos and, you know, he wasn't landing all of his shots clean, but he was still very active and Broner still was on the receiving end of, you know, of, of, you know, of the blows. Um, again, uh, round three, I felt like, you know, Vargas still was pushing the pace and he threw a couple borderline, you know, low blows. Um, but Broner, I felt like he was starting to, you know, figure out that he could handle um, Vargas's power. And I felt like he was blocking more and he was starting to kind of maybe time him a little bit or, you know, get used to his, you know, his mannerisms in the ring. Um, also, I just um, he started picking up the activity too, like towards like the middle of the, of the third round. Um, at, you know, by round four, I already saw that um, Vargas was losing control of the pace of the, of the you know, of the fight. Um, he was getting caught with combos. You know, Broner started off the round with some nice right hands and some really sharp jabs. Like when Broner gets on the offense, he looks amazing. He just needs to let those hands go. It's really frustrating watching Broner because you know, we know how talented he truly is. So when he doesn't let his hands go, it just it gets really frustrating to watch. And it, it kind of feels almost as if, you know, he's giving those rounds away or maybe he was waiting for Jesse to kind of gas out a little bit or maybe he needs those couple of rounds to you know kind of warm up and figure you know try to figure jesse out a little bit i wasn't sure um but i knew by around already by round five you know vargas started developing that little mouse under his left eye um you know so it was it, it broner was definitely landing it was showing on vargas's face um I, I, by round six vargas was already you know you could tell he was you know fatigued he was taking shots to the body um and Vargas was also starting to kind of lean in and Broner just kept busy with the jab, you know, busy with the jab. And, you know, he landed a low blow also. And he got a, that's the round that he got a warning in. Um, and round seven, I felt like, um, you know, you know, Vargas had a couple successful overhand rights, you know, that landed really nicely on Broner. Thing is, is that I don't think that Vargas had, had the power to bother Broner with it. Um, you know, Broner was count, countering Vargas. He just finished that round very well. In round eight, um, you know, Vargas was still landing to his to the body, jabbing, you know, still, you know, landing his jab. His jab was his money shot in this fight. Um, Broner was looking more confident, you can tell, in his body, in his body movement. He was looking more confident in that round. He was letting his hands go. You know, he was he was like he had some nice, you know, one two combos. He was landing on on a uh, on um, Vargas. And um, it was a good, that was a good round, a really solid round for my, in my opinion for Broner. Round nine, um, Vargas started abandoning his jab a little bit, and he was still you know working you know the body, but he seemed to really get fatigued at this point. And by him let you know slowing down on his his jab, he was letting Broner even more into the fight. Um, you know, um, Broner was timing his right hand, and he was countering countering so well. And also, I found that, um, you know, Vargas and, and Broner had a lot of exchanges during that, during, you know, during that particular round. But I felt like Broner was getting the best of it. Um, in round 10, you know, Vargas was <laughs> really, really looked fatigued, in my opinion. Um, he started, that's when he started resorting to kind of swinging wildly a little bit. Um, he was up against the ropes. Um, and then I saw Broner you know, really putting on the pressure, you know, and Broner was still walking him down and he was landing combos and he just had, he had Vargas where he wanted him, in my opinion, in round 10. And then um, in round 11, I found that uh, Vargas, that cut, that cut that he got um, in his eye started bleeding. And I felt like that was kind of, it was bothering him. You could kind of see his face grimacing a little bit. Um, Broner was still coming forward, still walking him down. I felt like that was also a pretty solid round for, for Broner. I felt like the second half was where Broner really shined. And then in round 12, you know, I did see that um, Cunningham basically was telling him, you know, telling Broner, act like you need a knockout. 
You know, let's not leave this fight in the judge's hands because he knew that Vargas came out solid. You know, in the first half of the fight, he was pretty solid. So he's like, act like you need a knockout. And, you know, he didn't get the knockout. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, Jesse Vargas is, has never been knocked out before. He's extremely hardy, you know, extremely, you know, he, he's, he's a very, he has just has the, this amount of grit that you probably don't see in many boxers. He's not going to go down without a fight. And he gave Broner a good fight. But in my opinion, I felt like Broner edged it out by two rounds. Take a bow, Mimi. What a breakdown there. Um, yeah, I mean, just to, just to, you know, go back onto the predictions also, just before we uh, wrap up part one. Um, I had Charlo by knockout. I had Davis by knockout. So did I as in the listeners on both of those. So we all gain a point there. Ultimately, after the six predictions that we gave last week, I got four right out of six. The listeners got four right out of six. And I has got three right out of six, which actually means now the listeners have caught back up with I has. So the listeners and I has both tying at the moment in the lead. And I am quite a few steps behind we won't talk about that but yeah um excellent breakdown there Mimi um that really wraps up the the reviewing part of the show just before we wrap up part one like I said there's one last thing to do that of course is to welcome our very first guest ladies and gentlemen please welcome the former English champion the former British champion and the former IBF flyweight world title challenger Mr Charlie Edwards Charlie welcome to the show my man thank you thank you for having me on it's my pleasure, my friend. So, Charlie, first things first, your next fight has been announced now. It's set for June 16th in Newcastle. In the other corner is Anthony Nelson, a man that gave uh, the public an absolute war of a fight when he took on Jamie Conlon back in 2016. But firstly, Charlie, what do you know about Anthony? Um, I know I know he's a, base, a basic fighter, really. Let's be honest. He's a basic, tough, strong game fighter. Like, he's there to be hit, he's going to come and he's going to try and get close to me and just plod along forward and try and, like, push me on the back foot. But he's, he's a type of fighter that, like, he wants he wants you to hit him and stand there so he can hit you back, where I've got a better boxing brain than that. And the way I move, the way I make people miss, I'm going to I'm gonna let him walk onto them jabs, push the jab in his face, and then he's, he's going to be there every time for me. And uh, I'm... It's a stylistic fight where it's going to be a brilliant match-up for me anyway. And a lot of the boxing fans have reacted well to this fight. They like that fight. Obviously, um, you know, since your unfortunate loss for the world title, you've had four fights, one against Ian Butcher, the other three against relatively unknown opponents. I'm guessing that the drop-down in level, which of course is part of the rebuilding process after losing a fight, but I'm guessing the drop-down in level can be a challenge for yourself to find that motivation. So my question is, if that is the case, does Anthony Nelson, you know, does that fight get your juices flowing, so to speak? Uh, yeah, it does. Like Since the British title fight, I've wanted to be in competitive fights and I've wanted to step up and like, that's what we our plan was to, to vacate the British and step up to get these like world ranking fights. Um, the, the, the two fights that I fought in my last fight were fights that we did not want. Um, I, I got told my opponent both times on fight week, one the, the, the night before the fight, it was it was really like embarrassing and frustrating to be honest, um, especially with all the pullouts and we we really had a bit of a stalemate year the last year because like we wanted them fights and they fell through and there was nothing I could do about it and it to be honest it looked embarrassing for my career and it looked like I was not wanting proper fights because on the outside people don't really see it all, all the politics that go behind it and um, I've wanted to be in um, in like championship fights straight after the British. I wanted to step up. I've been gunning for Cal Fire for the last year and um, he just kind of like, ain't been entertaining me and with the fights that fell through, I don't blame him really. But um, I'm glad to be back into a, like, a competitive fight now. Um, Andy Nelson's uh, the exact opponent that I know I can, like, his style is made for me. So um, I'm really looking forward to it. He also gives the British public a, a very good showcase when he had that war with Jamie Conlon. So people know he's no mug, he's tough, he's game, and he's going to come and try and cause an upset. But believe you me, he's going to be getting a boxing lesson. And that fight that you mentioned there that I mentioned also against Conlon, did you watch that at the time or is that something that you've watched recently? It was a fight of the year contender at the time. Yeah, they won fight of the year. Oh, did they, they win won it? Fight they won fight of the year. Yeah, they won it. And um, 
yeah, it's a fight I watched at the time, and it's a fight like that. It was just, it was just both of them was like just you hit me, I hit you, and that's that's not what boxing's about. Boxing's about making someone miss and making them pay, and that's what I'm going to do to Anthony Nelson tonight. And obviously, just um, it, it seems like it's a very mutual kind of thing, and it, it all ended on good terms. But the recent news that you've parted ways with Adam Booth, if you could just give us a, a little sentence or two on that one, Char. Yeah, um, I parted ways with um, Adam Booth. I decided to move back up to Sheffield and um, train with uh, Grant Smith alongside my brother, Sonny Edwards. He's a really great coach, and um, I'm looking forward to push on and um, work work now with uh, Grant and... Um, but me and Adam, we finished on great, great terms, and he's a friend for life, 100%. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And like I say, Charlie, not to look uh, back in the past, uh, you know, and also at a negative too much, but because we haven't really spoke since, you know, well, about boxing anyway, since before the world title fight, did that take anything out of you mentally? Were you down for a long period of time afterwards? What effect did it have on you, and how long did it last for? Um... To be fair, it did. It took me about a month to get over it. I was like, I didn't want to go out of the house. I, I felt like I've let everyone down and I was embarrassed, really, even though I, I actually showed a lot more and got a lot more respect from everyone. And I think that helped my fan base go up, how like how much heart I had and how I weren't just going to lay down and like how I wanted it. I wanted it and wouldn't stop going. And I took it as such a risk in my just my um, eighth, eighth fight. So it was like... It's one of them them things, but I was heartbroken. I was lost, and it took me like a month to get over it. Um, well, then I wiped myself down, and I made sure I was back out in in November because I I just wanted to get back on the horse. Didn't want to wait too long. Yeah. And obviously you were trying that night to become the quickest Englishman to win a world title, which would have been your ninth fight. However, you didn't uh, disgrace yourself. Like I say, it was certainly competitive while it lasted. What did Casimiro do good, though? Sharing the ring with him, what was it that made him world-class, Char? He fucking battered me. <laughs> <laughs> he <laughs> no, did No, it was just, um, it, it just, it just controlled the distance and... I was inexperienced, and he really showed his experience. And he was a lot, lot stronger than me. I was, um, I wasn't strong enough. I didn't have the the, the right um, leg structure, and like, I wasn't as strong on my legs like I am now. So it made me like reevaluate things, and it made me change a lot of things. But um, it's, it was all experience, and it's. I'm still, I'm, st- I still would not, not take that fight at that time if I could pick now. Do you know what I mean? It gave me a lot of experience, and it showed me the real things about boxing, the real politics behind boxing as well. After it. And it gave me valuable life lessons with like people who was trying to associate with me, trying to be all friendly. And so it, it was a it was a really eye opening experience. And yeah, ha- I mean, had had I did win that fight, I don't think I'll be the the fighter I'm gonna be because it might have got me a bit too big time at the time in such an early stage of my career. Yeah, I mean, they say, you know, to take a loss early on is obviously a lot better than when you get to the top. But saying that, and it was, at it was world a world title level. level. Well. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, so no that's shame. Like in I that, was man. losing beneath myself. No, 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 not at all, not at all. Like I say, no shame in that whatsoever. Really uh, brave effort, like I say, to jump up to that level. I'm going to throw a tricky question your way now, Charlie. Um, two fights ago, you boxed Craig Derbyshire. You won every round yeah. over eight rounds. You won yeah. on points. However, obviously, you know, he's also the man that you made your debut uh, debut against. Yeah. On that occasion, though, you knocked him out in four. So on paper, that yeah. doesn't look so good. But what is the real reason behind that? Did you did you do, uh, you know, better with Craig in the first fight because he'd only had no, two fights at the time and he's now got 28 the in the re- second fight? The real reason behind it is simply the fact that I was on standby to fight Kyle Yafaif if anything went wrong with his um, title defence two weeks after. So really, I just got in that fight and I was just using it as a sparring session. If I'm on, I didn't get out of first gear, and all I was doing was making sure I weren't getting cut, like any heads and no injuries. Make sure my hands were perfect, and I was just like, I didn't get out of first gear. Like in the first fight, I tried to stop him. The the second fight, I was just playing with him and just like just went lackadaisy and just kind of like done like a professional job just because I knew I might be out again to fight for the opportunity for a world title so I couldn't afford no injuries. Yeah, it wasn't like it was a bad fight. It was it was a boxing lesson, to be honest. I remember you I just, that's what I mean. at will. I think, yeah. yeah, that's all I've done because I didn't want to risk like going in there and trying to 
knock someone out, you can hurt your hands, you can walk into a head. Do you know what I mean? Where I quite easily, if I got in the ring with him again, I would. Cause if I didn't have nothing in the pipeline, but I, I couldn't take no risks at the time. Yeah, fair play, fair play. And obviously your fight against Ian Butcher on June 16th is also for a piece of silverware. It's for the WBA Continental Super Flyweight title. Obviously yeah, the and, winner... Anthony Nelson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who did I say? Oh, Ian Butcher. Sorry, my you bad. Said my Ian bad. Butcher. My bad, my bad. Good job that you're awake. Obviously, <laughs> the winner of this fight will then receive a top 15 ranking with a WBA. The holder of the WBA belt is, is of course, Cal Yafai. Now, you seem to be yeah. chasing that fight... It, it doesn't seem like he's that interested in the fight. So let me just clear he's this up. Let me just clear this up, Jar. Just... Go on, go he on. He knows. He knows. He knows the score. That's why he's not interested. He knows I'm all wrong for him. So let me clear this up. You want the fight. I believe, from what I've heard Eddie Hearn say, who promotes you both, he wants the yep. fight. It seems like the only person that doesn't want it is Cal. But obviously, Eddie Hearn has secured this WBA Continental belt to go on the line so that you know, you're going to be ranked in the top 15. So is there a method yeah. behind that, or is it simply because the belt was vacant it's and a, the opportunity was there? No, it's, we're, we're, we're trying to back him into the corner, and um, Eddie wants to fight. And um, I've got to, I want to go that route. I want him. I want to fight him. And uh, I, I believe I can beat him and do a number on him. So um, that's what Eddie wants, listen. And that's what I want. It's the only one that doesn't want it at the moment is him. And I don't blame him. You don't blame him because of... Of what? Because I, because I'll be taking his belt off him. Do you believe he knows that deep down? I think he knows I'm all wrong for him. He might be confident, like he says, he thinks he can knock me out in in three rounds. If he was that confident, why wouldn't you get your highest payday to put someone away and build an actual fan base in the UK? Because fighting me would make it a big fight. Look at Isaac Chamberlain and Akoli. Yeah. Every time there's British fighters that come together for, for titles, and especially a world title, it goes massive. And it gives some real needles, some real stick. Everything can, can, all the hype can build up. Sky cameras get behind it. So it's a no-brainer if you can knock someone out in three rounds. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, if, if Cal is listening, I must say to him as well, he's a man that's been on this show before, I would say, there's not many names, really big names, that the casual fan know um, in, you know, in, in the super flyweight division. There is only really the two top names, are, are, you know, in Britain, is yourself and him. So I don't really see why the fight can't take place. Like you say, it'd be career changing or career, you know, you know career highest payday. So, uh doesn't make much sense, Char, does it? <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> so I want to ask you also, if you've got one, have you got any kind of prediction how you reckon you'll beat Nelson? It sounds like you're just going to go in there and box his head off, to be honest. I'm going to dissect him, and I'm going to hopefully get him out of there later on. Excellent, excellent. And I want to ask you this as well, Char. What is your ideal year? This time in 2019, so April, at the back end of April 2019, where where, where, where can you be without kind of going into a dream world? Where do you reckon you can be this time next year? 100% I can be a world champion if Kyrie Fike gives me the opportunity. Yeah? Yeah, 1,000%. All right, and lastly, just before I let you go, Char, anything that you want to say at all to anybody that may be listening? I just want to say thank you everyone for like the ongoing support. Like this last year has been so frustrating for me, but I'm going to be back with a bang on um, June the 16th in front of um, Andy Nelson's home crowd, and I'm going to really show what I have been working on away from the ring and all the improvements I have made. And I'm looking forward to getting back on the journey. Excellent. Well said, my man. Right. Listen, Charlie, it's always a pleasure, my brother. Thank you for your time. Best of luck for June 16th, and we'll catch up sometime after, I hope. Nice one. Thank you. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, is usually the news part. I, as usually, does the news, but he has sent me the latest and greatest news, I'm hoping, here. So let me just have a little look through this. Um, firstly, Clarissa Shields will take on Hannah Gabriels on June 22nd in Detroit. It's going to be for the vacant WBA and vacant IBF female middleweight world titles. So Clarissa Shields going down in weight for another two world titles there. So she could become a four-time world champion or, you know, at least holding four belts in, I think that's about, 
what's that, about six fights I think she's had after that one, so that is quite amazing for her. Um, she's a friend of the show, she's been on before. We had her singing Rihanna actually last time she came on, so maybe we'll try and get her back on soon. That one, of course, June 22nd. Um, also, we have Lewis Ritson to defend his British lightweight title against Paul Hyland Jr. That's his mandatory for that. That one's going to be on June 16th at the um, the Newcastle Arena, I believe it's called. It's in Newcastle anyway. That's going to be on Sky Sports. Also on that undercard, um, Josh Kelly, a man that we had on the show last week, he will be on that undercard. And also, of course, our first guest on this show, Charlie Edwards from earlier, he'll be on that bill as well, as we mentioned. So, yeah, great card there. Also, we have a bit of a situation I'm going to discuss with you here, Mimi. Um, Dillian White is pretty angry right now with the WBC because he's been ranked number one for quite a while and he's really waiting for that shot at Deontay Wilder. But it seems that the the Eric Molina and Dominic Brazil fight, which um, was apparently not supposed to be, you know, like a final eliminator, well, now people are saying that... You know, the rumour is that the WBC have gone back on that, even though the fight's long finished now, and said that actually it was a final eliminator and that Brazil will now be the next in line to take on Deontay Wilder. So, um, I mean, perhaps it would make a better fight, but that's another story. I feel that White probably does have a right to feel frustrated here. Um, The thing is, I think there's mixed messages because from... Um, from an interview I did with Eric Molina, I think it was on Fight Week when he took on Dominic Brazil, I'm sure he told me that it was definitely some kind of eliminator. It may have just been an eliminator, not necessarily a final eliminator, but it turns out that it was a final eliminator and now Brazil will get the shot at Wilder, providing the Joshua Wilder fight, you know, the unification fight doesn't come before that, which of course they then make way for that, but it seems like Brazil will be next in line. I haven't really got problems with that fight, I think it's a good fight, but back to the actual point. Wilder um, seems like he's going to be taking on Brazil, and Dillian White's very frustrated with that. Does he have a right to be frustrated, Mimi, in your opinion? I mean, he was ranked number one, you know, <laughs> yeah. in, the w, in, you know in the WBC. I understand his frustration. Um, why isn't that fight happening? I don't know. I, I wish I knew. I mean, you could only we could only speculate from the outside, you know. Um, it's just a matter of just everybody just getting getting in tune to what's supposed to happen and essentially what we all want to do is get to the AJ Wilder fight that's ev- that's what everybody wants so whatever it takes to get there whatever you know people have to fight and you know and now if they made Brazil you know his mandatory then you know I don't have me personally I don't have a problem with Brazil um I know that him and Wilder have a little bit of a past you know um but uh yeah, I think that Brazil would be a great fight. And, you know, but White would also be a great fight with Wilder, too. So I, I can't, I can't, you know, argue either one. Yeah, I've got a lot of time for Dominic Brazil. He's another guy that, um, he, him and his manager, really, really, really good people. I think he's his manager. I think he's actually his publicist. Very, very nice people, actually. And um, if that fight does end up happening, we'll certainly get him on the phone. Um also, in, in other news, also regarding a WBC title, but it's going to be down at welterweight, this one, of course. Keith Furman gave up his WBC title over the last couple of days. It seems that hand injuries, I believe, is um, and, and elbow injuries, if I'm not mistaken, seem to kind of be derailing um, Keith Furman's whole fight plans, really. I mean... Um, I think he's also, he's, I think he's still got, is it the WBA he's still got off the top of my head? I even get confused. Yeah, he's got the WBA, hasn't he? So I think he's still got that, but he's had to give up the WBC. I'm guessing because they probably tried to force a fight onto him. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it was obviously too soon for his liking. A lot of people kind of saying that he's fell out of love with the sport, Mimi. I don't really like that, uh, that opinion there because I... I give Furman massive credit. He's the only unified welterweight champion um, out of all the guys that are there. He's the guy that took on, you know, arguably the top two or three at the time, or certainly the top five in in back-to-back fights. Danny Garcia, of course, and Sean Porter. And the jobs that he he did on those two guys, I felt really deserved him that number one status for a while. And I don't really take it um, too lightly. When people start criticizing him, I start getting a bit defensive. So I really like 
Furman, but if it's true that his hunger's kind of leaving him, which there's no real proof of that, I don't feel, if you know, from anything he's actually said. But um, it's a shame if the hunger is going in, you know, at the end of the day, isn't it? Um, absolutely. If, if that is really the case, that is a very big shame. And, a, you know, and, it, and it's sad because he is very, extremely talented. He is probably one of my favorite welterweights right now. And he is unified because he he knows what he's doing and he deserves to be unified. Um, I know that he had a fight coming up. He wanted to get a couple tune up fights before, you know, you know, getting into talks about the Spence fight because he had gotten injured. Um, he had been out for a while, so he wanted to get some tuna fights, and then he ended up getting hurt again. So then he ended up postponing the fight, and then next thing, the next news we hear about it about him is that he's vacating. Um, is this a matter of him losing love for what he does? Who knows? I mean, this that's all speculation, but for me, he just got hurt again. It could be a matter of him just wanting to heal his body. You know, it could be a matter of him just wanting to be at a hundred percent before he gets himself back in, into you know, into the squared circle. I, I would be the same way. I, I wouldn't want to go in there and, you know, be hurt and, you know, just because of people making speculation or, you know, making rumors up. You know, he needs to be smart with his career. And I understand and I appreciate the fact that he is not holding the belt hostage. That is the most important thing here. Now he's leaving it open for others to fight for it because he knows he can't fight for it. And he's being really respectful of the belt and really respectful of the sport by doing that. And I guarantee that once he's at a hundred percent, if he decides to come back, he will get his belt back. I certainly hope so. I, uh, yeah, I certainly hope so. I don't think he's, you know, he's necessarily ducking anybody. I think he's just taking, um, you know, the necessary time out and, uh, the, the, the right kind of precautions before stepping in a fight with, you know, with somebody like Errol Spence, I certainly don't think he'd run away from that whatsoever. Some people just seem to forget that he's a unified world champion and an, un- an undefeated one and a guy that's really shown no flaws. I think him against Errol Spence is an absolute super fight and one that I personally would pay for, by the way. Um, in other news, though, the, the last piece of news, just to move on from this now, Gavin McDonnell will now be fighting Stuart Hall, of course, former world champion Stuart Hall. That one, I believe, is for the WBO Super Bantamweight International title. So a good fight there for Gavin McDonald. Seems like he's having back-to-back fights that are quite dangerous. Obviously, last time out against um, against Yafai, and now this time against Stuart Hall. It seems like um, there's, 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 there's a lot of kind of like, I want to say... Um, high risk, low reward attached to these fights. So I hope that he is getting rewarded quite highly and I hope that at the end of the tunnel there is some um, some kind of world title shot, if you like. But yeah, that's it for the news. Let's dive now into the preview part of the show. We're going to start with a fight that's happening at the Ice Sheffield. I think that's what it's called. In Sheffield, of course, Yorkshire, United Kingdom. One fight to me- or two fights to mention on this bill. Um, the former professional footballer or soccer player, I should say, with you here, Mimi, 24 and 7, Curtis Woodhouse, his opponent yet to be announced, he's fighting apparently on that bill there. Also, Liam Cameron, 20 and 5, defends his Commonwealth middleweight title against Nicky Gemman, 20 and 10 with one draw. Um, so yeah, quite a decent fight there, I suppose. I'm, I'm liking the look of Liam Cameron. He's taking to social media to call out a lot of people lately. <laughs> He's actually accusing some other fighters that some say would, you know, a more, a more accomplished. He's saying that they're ducking him. So it's, it's quite, it's quite entertaining seeing some of his tweets out there. Um, He's he's gained a fan in me. Also, moving over now to France. This is a bit of a strange one, actually, here. Vincent Legrand, 26-0, is fighting for the vacant EBU European flyweight title against a guy called Juan Hinostroza. Now, Juan Hinostroza has a record of 7-8 with one draw. I'm going to repeat that. Seven wins, eight losses, and one draw. He's taken on a guy who's 26-0 for the vacant European title. It sounds absolutely crazy. I believe that this guy, Vincent Legrand, 26 and 0, he was supposed to take on Andrew Selby, and that fight fell through. I think Andrew Selby picked up an injury and had to pull out. But you're telling me that they couldn't find a better replacement than a guy who's 7 and 8 with one draw. I just can't believe that fight's still going ahead. I can't believe that that fight is being sanctioned, but that one's happening over in France. Boy, oh boy. Moving over now to Germany. Um. 
couple fights to mention over here. The guy that recently lost to Callum Smith in the World Boxing Super Series when he stepped in for Jurgen Bremer. Nicky Holzkun, he went the distance in that fight in the end. His record 13-1, and one, of course that one lost to Callum Smith. He takes on a guy called Giard Ajetovic, who's 31-17 and 17 with one draw. Also on this bill, Arthur Abraham, former world champion, 46-6, and six, takes on Patrick Nielsen, 29-2. and two. The last time I saw Patrick Nielsen fight was when he got knocked out brutally by John Ryder on the, uh, on the Groves versus Jamie Cox undercard. That was a great, great win there for John Ryder. Uh, that one is happening over in Germany, like I say. And that one is a Sauerland promotion card. Um, over in Hungary now for this one, Prince Patel, the very controversial flyweight. Well, he used to be a flyweight. He's now at bantamweight, if I'm not mistaken. He fights for the vacant WBO European bantamweight title. Prince Patel, 12-0 and with one draw. He takes on Mishoku. I think it's Mishoku Subitiziz. Oh, God. Boy, oh boy, do you know what? I'm going to have to send you this one once again, Mimi. <laughs> you can do the pronouncing on this. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Mashiko Sabitzi. Sabitzi. Okay. So Wait, hold need... on, let me see. <laughs> yeah, say it, say it very fast. I think that would be the best. Mashiko Mashiko Sabitzi. Sabitzi. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like... Hold on, sounds... give me a second. Let me collect myself. Wait, okay. Mashiko Sabitzi. Yeah, okay. Um uh, he said okay. <laughs> we'll we'll roll with that. We'll roll with that. Shibitsy. It sounds like it sounds like we're a bit dizzy. Um, yeah, yeah. Mashiko like Well good luck to Mashiko. Good luck to I'm just gonna call him Mashiko. Good luck to Mashiko. Twenty and ten with three draws. He takes on our very own Prince Patel, the very controversial um, for the for the wrong reasons, I suppose, if you've seen some of his stuff. Um, moving over now to the Bilbao Arena in Bilbao, Paes Vasco in Spain. Now, this one here, um, this one will be shown on Box Nation in the UK. Our very own Boy Jones Jr. takes on a yet-to-be-announced opponent. That's a six-rounder there. Um, also on this bill, Andoni Gargo, his record 18-3 and three with three draws. I'm going to throw him a nice little mention there because he is a guy that I remember um, getting absolutely beaten up and then knocked out by Lee Selby. I think that was on the Bellew Hay undercard the first time round, if I'm not mistaken. I haven't checked that. I'm just going on knowledge there. I believe, I believe somewhere in my head it's telling me that. He fights anyway, Andoni Gargo, for the vacant EBU European Union featherweight title against a guy called Jeffrey De Santos, who's actually eleven and zero. So all the very best to Andoni Gargo. I'd like to see him win a little a little um, title there. Well, not a little title. It's the EBU European Union title. So all the very best to him. That's a twelve rounder there. But the main event here for the vacant EBU European welterweight title, the full proper European title. In one corner, the home fighter Kerman Lejaraga who is 24 and 0 undefeated he takes on our very own Bradley Skeet 27 and 1 of course this one a 12 rounder a very good friend of the show Bradley Skeet we will look to speak to him hopefully after his victory here i remember when we had him on the show and we were talking about this fight and i was um we were kind of joking about this guy Kerman Laharaga how to pronounce his name and um his promoters, Mimi, this is actually true. This guy, Kerm, he's, he's a Spanish guy, but he's got a kind of unusual name. He's from Spain. Um, he lives in Spain. The fight's happening in Spain. His promoters are Spanish and all that. But his name is Kerman Lajaraga. And when we were pronouncing his name, I was, I was joking around and saying to the guy that's fighting him, you know, how do you pronounce his name? And he wasn't too good at, at pronouncing his name. And the promoter of the show listened to the podcast and actually said, you will learn how to say his name come fight night. <laughs> so there's a bit of um, animosity there, I suppose. But yeah, all the very best to Bradley Ski. I know he's out there in Spain. Hopefully he gets the job done and then moves on to something a little bit bigger, like a world title fight, perhaps. Um, moving over now, though, to the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York, USA. This one's going to be shown on HBO. So if you're at home in the US, you can watch it on HBO. If you're at home in the UK, you can watch it on Sky. But if your name is Mimi Melendez, you can watch it from a few rows back. Mimi, you will be there in attendance in Brooklyn going to your, to your, uh, to your first fight card. So are you excited for this one? And if so, why are you excited? I am extremely excited. I've always heard about, you know... 
the just the atmosphere of the Barclays Center and you know, Jacobs is one of my favorite, you know, uh, middleweight fighters. Um, and I get to see Katie Taylor. I'm really excited that she's going to be on the undercard. I think she's amazing. Um, get to see Big Baby. You know, he's also somebody like from Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah, so it's it's really exciting for me. I just want to be there. And, you know, it's just the fact that I'm even going to, this is going to be my first fight, my first professional fight that I actually attend in person. I've been watching boxing for years, but it's always been on TV. So this is just going to be so much better because everybody else is going to be in the same mood that I'm in, you know, excited about the fight. So I just, I just can't wait. And starting with the undercard here, a guy who was an Olympic gold medal in 2016, um, a guy that I think, if I'm not mistaken, he's the guy that Josh Kelly fought in the Olympics, and of course he, you know, he he knocked Josh Kelly out of the Olympics in I think it was the second round or something like that. I'm not sure how they do it now, but this guy eventually ended up winning the gold medal. He's a guy from the Kazakhstan, and his name is Daniyar Yelusinov. He's making his debut here. He signed a promotional contract recently with Eddie Hearn. Um, he takes on a guy who's undefeated, actually, called Noah Kid. So uh, that guy's 3-0 and with one draw. Um, yeah, Noah Kid. <laughs> that sounds so weird, that name, actually. <laughs> and also on this bill, like you say, Katie Taylor, 8-0. and She defends her WBA World Female Lightweight title, but in the other corner, no, uh, no mug, I want to say here. That sounds kind of bad, even thinking about calling a lady a mug. But anyway, Victoria Bustos, 18-4. and No walkover, is what I should say. She is the IBF World Female Lightweight title. It's going to be a 10 two-minute round contest here. Of course, all the very best to Katie Taylor in that one. And um, you said it yourself, Mimi, you'll be excited to see her live. She is really, really, really good. I've seen her live a couple of times. But moving up the bill once again, big baby Jarrell Miller, 20-0 and with one draw, friend of the show. He's in a 12-round fight against Johan Duapas, former opponent of um, of Deontay Wilder. But it took Deontay Wilder quite a while to get rid of him. And I think Povetkin also fought Duapas. I think it took him six rounds without checking. So um, he's quite durable. And at that time, Povetkin was very questionably um, getting into shape, I should say. His record, by the way, Duapas, 37-4. That should be quite a good fight there, by the way. Um, but the main event, the Miracle Man himself, I've actually seen that HBO are driving this bus around around, around Brooklyn, and um, it's got Danny Jacobs' face on the side of it. It's quite remarkable. But yeah, Danny Jacobs, 33-2. and two. He's in a 12-rounder against Maciel Selecki, 26-0. and 0. Perfect record. The guy from... Uh, the guy from Poland, who is actually a really good fighter. He's kind of been based out in the U.S. for quite a while now, if I'm not mistaken. I think he even fought on one of the undercards of um, of one of the World Boxing Super Series, um, you know, tournament fights or one of the cards. I'm sure he was on the undercard for one of those. And um, he's actually a good fighter. But like I say, some of the, you know, the, the kind of casual fans wouldn't have really heard of him. But he's actually quite a good fighter, so it is it is a steady step up, I suppose, for Daniel Jacobs. I suppose we want to see him in with some of the names that you mentioned earlier in the middleweight division, really, Mimi, the likes of BJS, the likes of Charlo and the others. But um, it's not a bad fight, so I don't think we can we can overlook Selecki. I think he's quite a good fighter, but um, yeah, what's your, what's your thoughts on that fight there? We don't know too much about Selecki. Um, yeah, I, again, I want to reiterate, I don't know much about Saliki, um, but I do do, I like Jacobs. What can I say? Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of Jacobs. I think he's extremely talented and I feel like he's the whole package. You know, I, I loved him in the triple G fight and I feel, I watch all of his fights, every single fight, even the one where he got knocked out by Parag, every single fight I've watched. I've been a fan of his since the beginning of his career. Um, and I get to see him live. So um, you know, and I, I just, you know, wish him the best and good luck to Suleiki. Good luck to Suleiki, yeah. Um, some of the guys that, you know, that are notable, I suppose, on Suleiki's resume, it may surprise some people. Um, he he actually was the guy that took the O of Hugo Centeno Jr. Um, that was back in 2016. Hugo Centeno, we mentioned earlier, he lost to Jamal Charlo, of course. Uh, we said in the review part. So, yeah, he actually TKO'd him in round 10. So, that's a name there. And also, he's coming off, most recently, Selecki, he's coming off a win over Jack Kulkai. That was back in 
um, in October of 2017. So that was his last fight. And Jack Kulkai, of course, a former world champion. So, yeah, Selecki, Selecki's certainly no mug. Um, he's highly ranked with, with all the sanctioning bodies. So, um, yeah, quite a good fight there. He, he doesn't really have... Um, have the power. I mean, he's got 10 knockouts from 26 wins, and, you know, I have to be honest, I haven't seen much of him, but he seems like he's quite a good boxer, not really the power puncher that's going to stand and trade. So if he's got a bit of movement about him, it could be quite interesting, actually. It could be quite interesting, because I think at times, um, Daniel Jacobs, you know, the the criticism that I will have of him is that I feel that sometimes, because he's a great boxer as well, I feel that sometimes he can neglect his boxing skills and kind of really go for it and stand in the pocket a little bit too long. Um, I feel that he did that against Triple G in spurts, but I also think he boxed quite clever in that fight. But yeah, I think that's the only real kind of danger there. But I think he will, um, you know, he will beat Selecki and probably in style, probably by a stoppage. So um yeah, a good a good steady fight for him. Of course, this is another um, Eddie Hearn show. It's his second show now in the United States. So, um, yeah, looking forward to watching that one, actually. Um, Box Nation will also be showing this card that's happening, um, happening, I think it's at the same time. It's happening over in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at the... Uh, I think this is how you say it, the Lear Chorus Center. It's not a popular venue, I don't think. But anyway, on this bill, the the Olympian, of course, the silver medalist, Shakur Stevenson, a man that has also been on this show. It seems like I've said that a million times today. He takes on a guy with a wicked name, by the way. This guy's name is Roxburgh Patrick Riley. That is a brilliant name. 12 and 0 he is. That's an eight-rounder there. Also on this bill, B.Y. Bryant Jennings, another man that's been on this show. Um, his record, 22 and 2. Those two losses to very good fighters, by the way, Vladimir Klitschko and Luis Ortiz. He fights for a title that I had never even heard of, actually, until reading this. He fights for the vacant USA Pennsylvania State heavyweight title. He takes on Joey Dueco in the other corner, 19 and 4 with four draws. All the very best to Bryant Jennings. Another man that's been on this show is on this bill. Jesse Hart, 23-1. and one, His only loss at world title level to Gilberto Ramirez for the WBO super middleweight title back in 2017. He fights for the vacant NABF super middleweight title against... Demond Nicholson, I think it said. Demond Nicholson, eighteen and two with one draw. It's um, it's a big step up for Nicholson actually. That one, it's a ten rounder there. And the main event for the WBO World Super Bantamweight Title, Jesse Magdaleno, twenty five and O, oh, the man that um actually beat Nanito Denaire. I think it was a couple years ago now. He beat Nanito Denaire, and Nanito has been chasing him for a rematch ever since. And Nanito tells me that Magdaleno doesn't want it. Well, anyway, he takes on Garn. Ghana's very own Isaac Dogbo, 18 and 0. Somebody's O must go. A combined record there of 43 and 0. That one's going to be shown on ESPN in the States, but it will be shown in in the UK on Box Nation. So you'll have to tape that one while you're in Brooklyn, Mimi, I'm guessing. Um, moving over now to the final couple bills that are just happening all over the place, really. Uh, this one in El Paso, Texas, we have at the Don Haskins Convention Center. This one's going to be on Fox. This is this is a real busy weekend for the US TV. This one um, features another few guys, really. Um, Erickson Lubin, 18-1, and one, obviously, that one loss to Jamel Charlo. He takes on Oscar Cortez, who's 26-3. and three. That's a 10-rounder there. I'm looking to um, I'm looking forward to seeing the return of Lubin actually, a really promising prospect. Also Jorge Lara, 29 and 0 with two draws, takes on Claudio Marrero, 22 and 2. Anthony Durrell, 31 and 1 with one draw, takes on Abraham Hand, 26 and 3 with one draw. Um, Anthony Durrell, a real strange fight last time out when he took on Dennis Duglin. Um, that fight seemed to end very, very controversially on a very small cut. It almost looked like a like a paper cut that stopped the fight. Really, really weird stuff there. And I know that Dennis Duglin really wants that rematch. That could have happened. I don't see why not. But this is a 10-rounder for that one. 
Also, Josecito Lopez tops the bill, 35 and 7. He takes on the undefeated 17 and 0 Miguel Cruz. That could be quite interesting. Moving over now to the Menominee Arena in Wisconsin, USA. What do we have on this one? I've bookmarked this one. One fight on here. I'm not even sure it's happening, but just in case it does, he's a friend of the show, and once again, he's been on the show. 41 and 8 with one draw. He's having his 51st professional fight more fights than his promoter it's of course Mr. Ashley Theophane part of the money team his opponent yet to be announced but that really is the fight oh no no that's not the final fight to mention there's one last fight to mention that's actually happening um on Wednesday the 2nd of May so that is next Wednesday but by the time the show goes out next Thursday the fight would have already happened this is quite remarkable here it's happening over in Thailand in one corner Chea von Moonsri, 49-0. He puts his WBC World Minimum Weight title on the line against Leroy Estrada, who's 16-2. and But he's actually a very good fighter. It's no given, that fight. It's a really, really tough fight. And should Chea von Moonsri win, he becomes 50-0. and He actually equals Floyd Mayweather's record. So that really could be amazing. Now, what I want him to do, ideally is win this fight, become 50-0, and and just have one more fight and then retire. That's what I want him to do, just to beat Floyd's resume. Um, all the very best, Mimi. I'm sure that you 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 echo my sentiments when I when I wish Chea von Moonsri all the best of luck in becoming 50-0 and next Wednesday. Absolutely. Big up to Chea von Moonsri. Right, just before we wrap up part two, there's one last thing to do. It's been a long show. I apologize if I've been rambling too much. But the last thing to do, just before... We wrap up part two is to welcome Mr. Ishe Smith. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former IBF junior middleweight world champion, Mr. Ishe Smith. Ishe, welcome back on the show, my friend. Hey, how you doing? It's good to be back. How's yeah, everything? It's all great, my friend. It's good to have you back on. So, Ishe, first things first, we spoke back in December on what was actually a little fact I'm going to throw out now. It was actually our most listened to podcast out of all the podcasts we've done. So that was a good thing. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was, a, it was a great thing there. We obviously spoke a lot about your career. At that time, you'd just come off the loss to Julian Williams. But it's a new year. It's a new chapter. On May the 11th, you'll take on the former IBF junior middleweight world title challenger, Mr. Tony Harrison. So firstly, Ishe, what do you know about Tony? Uh, he's uh, nothing different than anything I face. A, a good fighter. Uh, you know, I've always been the run to want to take risks throughout my career and fight the best. And uh, he's considered young and, and dangerous and one of the best out there. So, uh, you know, I, I'm staying, staying with that. You know, I just want to fight the best and put my, myself in a better position and, and give myself better opportunities. And he, uh, he was the one that could do that. And have you ever ran into Tony Harrison before, Ishe? Because obviously he's only 27, he's still young, but I always think he's much older because it seems like ages ago when he was being trained by Emmanuel Stewart, the late, great Emmanuel Stewart. Uh, I've never ran into him personally, uh, but, you know, when you've been in this game as long as I have, you know who the, who, the who's who are boxing. Yeah, I see, I see, I see. And the most recent fight that I watched of Tony Harrison was his fight against Jarrett Hurd for the vacant world title, which coincidentally was your old world title. Did you happen to see that fight? Because in my eyes, I actually thought that, especially in the early rounds, Harrison was able to comfortably outbox Hurd for much of that fight. Yeah, I saw um, some of it, and, you know, and, uh, you know, I I was able to look at some of it, but... uh, you know, unfortunately, he, uh, you know, her storm back and, and won. And, uh, you know, I was able to peek at a little bit of it. But uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good little fighter, a good little kid. And obviously, your fight will be happening in your hometown of Las Vegas. It will be shown live on Bounce TV in the in the United States. Unless I'm mistaken, I think that's three fights in a row now on Bounce for you. Yes, uh, Bounce has, uh, has done well um, throughout my career. I mean, especially at this stage, you know, they have spared no expense going out and and profiling me and and my family and and my career. And, uh, you know, I I really do appreciate it. I mean, I've been on every network from NBC to ESPN and HBO, Showtime, and I appeared multiple times on Showbox when that 
that series was kicking off. So, but at this stage and, and to have someone still be interested in my story and my career is, uh, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a blessing, man. And I don't, I don't take that for granted. And with the 154 pound division, obviously being a really hot division right now and the champions being so good, we have to give a lot of credit, actually, to Jarrett Hurd for recently unifying against Eris Landy Lara, who a lot of people felt was n- the number one man in that division. Did you see that fight? And if so, does that extra belt solidify Hurd as being the number one man, or is it Charlo? How do you see it? Oh, well, you you would have to give that to, to Hurd. He beat the man. I mean, you know, Lara was the man at 150, 54 pounds, and if you beat the man, you become the man. So, Right now, I think everybody's chasing um, chasing Jared Hurd. He's a, a good fighter, and uh, he beat the man who was the man. And, you know, you got to take your hat off to him. I was at that fight. It was a tremendous fight. It was a tremendous car put together by Mayweather Promotions, and um, it was just a hell of a hell of a, you know, every fight on the, on the bill from top to bottom was good. I was able to catch Julian Williams' fight and, and – and, uh, James DeGale's fight and and uh, the main event, you know, Laura and Hurd and, you know, those were all three great fights. So, you know, props to, to Showtime and Mayweather Promotions for put, putting together a great card. And on June the 9th, another big fight in the 154 division. Jamel Charlo defends his title against Austin Trout, a man that I kind of feel that he's He's sort of unlucky, I think, of of Austin Trout, despite being, I think he's a two-time world champion. I kind of feel that he's had some bad luck of of late. Um, Do you think he can roll back the years a little bit and, you know, give Charlo any problems in that fight? Well, I don't know if he can give him problems, but, uh, you know, whoever's behind him team-wise, I mean, he's got the best team in boxing. This is (laughs) three fights in a row. I think this is uh, three out of his last four fights have been you know, world title shots. So, you know, it, it, that's that's unbelievable. Uh, I mean, for him, I think he fought Charlo, or the other Charlo brother, and lost. And I think he came back and fought Hurd and lost. And I think he just took a tune-up in February, and he won that. And now he's getting another title shot. So this is three out of four fights for him that's uh, been title shots. So, man, major, major props to his team for keeping him you know relevant and and able to secure those title shots man that is that is unheard of yeah i suppose maybe he's not so lucky then i should say (laughs) um saddam ali versus liam smith that's actually happening i think the day after your fight who do you believe wins that one are you backing your fellow american saddam ali or are you backing your long lost cousin liam smith (laughs) oh man i don't i don't know who uh that's an interesting fight. I would uh, I would say that's a pick em. Um, You know, I think the only time I saw Liam was when he fought Cotto. I think it was Cotto, right? He Canelo, fought Cotto? He fought Canelo. Canelo, Canelo, Canelo. Okay, yeah, he fought Canelo. And uh, that was the only fight I saw. So, I don't know. And, uh, you know, Saddam Ali, I hadn't saw much as him. I saw him lose to Jesse. And I saw him come back and, you know, was able to beat Cotto. But, you know, we don't know how much Cotto had left at that point. So I, I just don't know. Uh, to me, I think that's a pick em fight. Uh, I just don't, I, you know, I, I don't know what to make out of either guy. You know, it, it's an interesting fight, but I, I, I would say it's a toss-up right now. Yeah, I think a lot of people who are very familiar with the pair also agree that it is a toss-up. It's, it's, it's supposed to be quite a good fight, that one. Hopefully, it plays to our expectations. Last time we spoke, Ishe, you did mention about your goal to at some point fight in the UK before your career is over. Now, right now, at 154, we only really have the likes of Liam Smith or Kel Brook. He's just moved up, of course, off the top of my head. Those are the two main guys. Do those fights have any potential of happening at this stage? Or is it looking a bit a bit more unlikely than last time we spoke? I was, you know, I was exchanging some messages uh, with Eddie Hearn some months back, and uh, you know, I, I think the the Kell Brook fight had been discussed, and um, they I think they went a different direction, and so I messaged uh, Eddie Hearn on Twitter and just told him that you know this is a fight that I'm very interested in. Um, you know, whether I have to 
whether he comes over here or go over there, it, it wouldn't matter. So I would love that fight in the future, you know, but first things first, I got to take care of business. Uh, for me, I, I, I don't know how many more fights, you know, I, I'll be willing to, to fight in Vegas. The judging here has, you know, pretty, has, has gotten pretty bad. So, um, you know, that has kind of left a sour taste in my mouth, whether I fight in Vegas or abroad or another state, you know, this could be my last fight in Vegas. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'll go back to some, uh, some defeats I've had here. I lost uh, my title to Carlos Molina here via split decision. I lost to Vanez, you know, um, majority decision. And then I lost to Julian Williams, unanimous decision with the fight, with the judge scoring the fight nine to one, which nobody won that fight nine to one or eight to two. And, you know, it's just the judging here has gotten pretty bad. It almost feels like, I think if I would have fought K-9 in Vegas, they probably would have gave K-9 the decision. So I was able to go to Detroit and take K-9's belt. And I've, I've been able to go to other people's hometown and beat them. I've been able to go to other people's hometown and also I, I didn't, didn't get a fair shake either. But it seems like every close fight here I lose or every fight that I, you know, before I started fighting here regularly, like I had never lost in Vegas. And I've never gotten gifted decisions here either. I just want what's fair to be fair. And I, I just don't feel like – um when you go out there and you fight a fight like I fought against Julian Williams, but your fight with the consensus was that it was a draw or it was a one or two point fight either way, and you have a judge score the fight nine to one, and you have another judge score the fight, you have uh, Max DeLuca score the fight nine to one, then you have Robert Hoyle score it eight to two, and then you have another judge score seven to three. It, it, it's just kind of, you know, it's like, why not? You know, it would take my show on the road. You know, it's just uh, the judges here, I don't, I don't trust anymore. You know, and I want to make sure that this fight right here, I have the right judges and that, uh, that you know, if there's any discrepancies with any judges, I'll make sure that I bring that up. But I just don't feel like the judging here has been fair. There's no criticism. There's no, can't criticize. You know, if I go and I do something to offend the commission, I get suspended or I get fined. A judge can, you know, a judge can score in a nine to one scorecard, and Bob Bennett does nothing about it. You know, Max DeLuca scored scored my fight against Julian Williams nine rounds to one. He gave me one round out of nine, out of ten. And the very next fight, uh, Julian Williams fought Nathaniel Gallimore, and Max DeLuca was the same judge on that card. You know, he was the same judge judging that fight. So it's like I don't mind taking a loss. I'm a throwback fighter. I, I don't care if I go if I go out there and I know I fight my heart out and I take a loss. It, you know, so be it. I, I gave the fans entertainment. I didn't mind taking a loss with Julian Williams. I thought it was close. I thought it could have been a draw. I thought it could have been either way. But when you have those kind of scores, it is you just you know it's, it's very disappointing, especially when you train as hard as I train and you've been in this game 18, 18 years, almost two decades. So. Um, it's just something I have to, you know, I have to look forward to because, you know, I got, I got to worry about that, that aspect of my career as well. The judging and all of that. People say, well, if you go to the UK, you won't get a fair, you may not get a fair shot. Well, fighting here, I'm, I'm pretty much not getting a fair shot either. And I'm at home. I don't feel like this fight. I'm actually at home. I feel like I'm on the road. I, I feel like I'm on the road now, you know, um, that I'm fighting guys and I'm, I'm not at home, you know, there's no, you know, I, like I said, I just want to, you know, just render a fair and just decision, whether I lose a close fight or whether I lose a unanimous decision. I never have complained about the large decision. That was one, you know, I'm I'm not the type that's going to complain and make up excuses with decisions. But when I go out there and I gave my a hundred percent and all the fans are clapping, everybody's happening. And you score that fight nine to one. And I, I, you know, I, I don't know what to say upon that. It's such a shame to hear you say that because obviously not just, you know, not just yourself, but even, you know, the, the, the city, Las Vegas, it's got such a historic uh, meaning in, in boxing and to have such awful judging. And I agree with you. I mean, um, as you brought it up there, Max DeLuca handing in quite a questionable scorecard between yourself and Julian Williams. When you just reminded me there, he was also a judge in the Williams and Gallimore fight. He, again, was the judge that scored it widest to Julian Williams. Another judge had it a draw, which I think it was a lot closer than 117-110, uh, which Max DeLuca gave in favour of Williams. So quite... Um 
quite a uh, strange, strange, I don't know, not a relationship, I'd say, between the two, but it seems like he favours him quite a lot. Yeah, there's, there's no way as a commission, there's just no way, if I know this guy scored in a questionable scorecard with my fight, Okay, let's just – I don't know what the fights he did after that. Let's just go, okay, I know he judged Julian Williams, and I know he scored that fight 9-1. to one. And if you poll 100 people, 100 people would tell you, whether they thought Julian won or they thought I won, 100 people would tell you Julian Williams didn't win that fight 9-1. to one. I don't care if you like me or if you hate me or whatever the case may be, nobody, not even myself, Nobody Stevie Wonder won that wouldn't have nine scored that 9-1. to one. Yeah, he wouldn't have scored a fight 9-1. to one. But then he's back judging another Julian Williams fight. And I approached him at the fight, and I told him, what kind of scorecard did you score? I've been knowing you for years. He was one of the judges on the contender. He was the only judge, you know, realistically that, you know, uh, he had me beating Sergio Moore in our five-round fight. So I remember, I have a very good memory. So I remember him. I met him, at uh, like, at a lounge that, during, like, one of the contender parties, and I was able to talk to him at the, the commission at the time, Dean Lohaus, and I, he introduced me to him, and I, I talked to Mac, and, he, you know, he had me beating Sergio Moore in our five-round fight, and that, that fight ended up being a split decision loss. But then I, I, I just, you know, I told him, what what were you seeing? And he said, well, I say, basically, you saying I got my ass whooped. He said, well, no, you could have lost every round but close. And I said, there's no way you could score that fight 9-1, to one, bro. I said, there's no way. I, You know, he was like, well, I don't think this is the time. This is right before the fighters like probably like five minutes before Julian Williams and Daniel Gallimore made his walk. And he said, well, Robert Hoyle scored at 8-2. to two. And I said, yeah, I already talked to Robert. I talked to Robert like months ago at a WBC event I was doing with WBC Cares for Kids. And I told him the same thing. And at least Robert said, well, I, I owe it to you to sit down and watch it with you to tell you why I came up with that scorecard. It, that probably would never happen. But when as a fighter, if you start questioning judges and start having conversation with judges outside of what you're supposed to be doing. Like I shouldn't have to be doing that. So it's like, I truly believe if I fought K nine in Vegas, they, it was a good fight. It was a close fight, but I won. I clearly won the fight. I truly believe they would have gave it to K nine. I would never became world champion. That's how much non faith I have in Vegas and the judges. I, I have zero faith in their judges no more. Absolutely zero zilch, none. And there's no penalty. There's no way. I told him, I said, there's no way if I was Gallimore's people, I would have had you judge in this fight. There's no absolute. If I if I realized that you, the one that scored the card 9-1 to one for Julian Williams against me, there's no way I would have had you back on this fight. I would have protested and got you off of here. And I told him that. You know, I, I'm not one that's shy or to hide my tongue or, or not say what's on my mind. And, you know, I, I told him that. So, you know, whatever it may be, but, you know, I just, like I said, I, I don't feel these judges are competent. It's not just Vegas, but it's just I have to deal with what's affected me and, and what's going on with me. And, I, I, you know, I hadn't lost here as a professional before. My first loss, which was Molina, and, you know, ever since then, it's just been like every close fight or every fight people feel like I'm, I'm winning or, or in, these judges are just, they're crazy, man. And it's just, it's unfortunate because they, they determine whether things happen for you or not. Like Julian Williams got a IBF, well, he got a title eliminator off my fight. What if I would have won? That could have been me and that eliminator. You know, see, see, they dictate a lot. But instead, now I got to fight Tony Harrison, which, you know, I'm happy I'm active. But you see how I say they determine a lot of things, what happened, how the dominoes and the chips may fall. So now I got to go fight Tony Harrison. I may get a title shot after once I'm victorious. But who knows? But Julian Williams was automatically put in the fight where once he won, he was given, you know, he was in the title eliminator. He was given practically a title shot. So, it's just disappointing. Like I said, I, I'm not a man to hide behind, you know, taking an L. We take L's in life every day. But, you know, for judges to score, turn in scorecards like that, it's why why even show up? You know, he should have just filled his scorecard out, stayed where he was at in the back locker room, filled it out, and that judge sent, should have been empty. Robert, too, no different. Seven to three, eight to two, nine to one. Come on, man. It's just like, come on, watch that fight, and you'll see that, that, that fight was – 
nowhere close. Seven to three wasn't as egregious as the other two, but I mean that wasn't even that was even pathetic. I mean the nine to one, eight to two is just ridiculous. Yeah, I agree. I watched the fight. I remember watching it live, and I, I don't agree with the you know the judges' scorecards and. It was quite crazy. Two facts I'm going to throw out. Um, shout out to K9, by the way. It's his birthday today. Um, and also, you, you say there, Carlos Molina, he actually told me a similar story. Um, he said that, I think he had a fight somewhere in South America, and it was an 11-round fight. And it was like a really, he believes he was served up a really bad decision. And when they went to the scorecards, one of the judges actually scored the fight for 12 rounds. And it was an 11 rounder. So that kind of says it all, you know, that's absolutely disgraceful. Mm -hmm. But um, coming down to the last couple of questions now, Isha, I don't want to keep you for too long. Um, I believe we will be speaking to Tony Harrison maybe next week or uh, I think probably sometime next week. I don't think it will be on fight week, but sometime beforehand. I don't know if there's any animosity. I'm guessing, no, you're quite a respectful guy. But if you've got any kind of message for him, what is that message? Um, Nothing. I mean, just good. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he's, uh, he's a consummate uh, professional. He's a good kid, so... I know he'll show up and be ready, and um, I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to be ready, and let's just go out there and put on a good fight for the kids. I mean, the days of me, and the trash talk is in the ring, man. I mean, I don't get into all that, man. We got to go out there and fight and make it and, and go out there and entertain these fans. And, uh, I, you know, I'm ready for everything. I mean, whatever ha whatever brings in the ring, there's nothing I haven't seen from sparring to fighting. I've been I've been boxing now, boxing now 18 years. So uh, you know, you said the kid was 27, so uh, he was 11. When I was a, a professional boxer. No, he he, he was uh, nine. Nine, uh, yeah, nine, yeah, I was just nine, yeah. He was nine years, yeah, nine years old when I was a prof when I turned pro. So uh, I know he's gonna go out there and fight. And everybody has this thing. Well, um, they would they want to stop me and they want to be the first to do it. So, you know, I know he's going to come out and he's going to try hard and, I, you know, I'll be ready. Um, we're ready for anything. And finally, I'd like to also give you an opportunity to say anything to your UK fans that may be listening. Any last message for those guys? Well, I hope to be abroad soon, whether that's against Kell Brook or um, Liam Smith or whoever. But um, I definitely want to cross that off my bucket list before I hang them up and, uh, Make it over there. So, Eddie Hearn, if you're listening, get in touch with Leonard um, when everything goes right with this one. And uh, let's make it happen. Absolutely. We certainly hope so. Okay, listen, Ishe, it's been a real pleasure, as it always is, speaking with you. Thank you for your time. Best of luck for May 11th. Hopefully, oh. no bad judging, and we will catch up soon. Okay, thank soon, you so sure. much. Okay. Okay, and this wraps up episode 132 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Mimi Melendez has been with me for the entirety of the show. A massive thanks also to our two guests on this week's show, the former IBF world champion, Ishe Smith, and the former IBF world title challenger, Mr. Charlie Edwards. The Prediction League currently stands at myself on 31 points, Ayaz on 37, and you, the listeners, with 37 also. So it's a draw between yourself and Ayaz. Um, look out for more polls next week as well. It'll be early next week on Twitter when we start, you know, opening up the polls for you to cast your votes on the Golovkin bill and also the Hay versus Bell U2 bill. Once again, the biggest thanks of all goes out to you, the listeners. Thank you all for being with us once again this week. Enjoy your weekends, people, and we shall see you all next week.